whereas for me they wouldn't have mattered and, and it's hard for me to look at the light sometimes when it comes to you know mcs events and stuff like that, that but it really is important for you guys that are battling because those you guys are the ones that are going to make this thing me and kiv and ghost and joke all these guys we're going to play it regardless you know, but for you guys that had the opportunity to make a club series, grind the leaderboard and feel what that's like, that's really what's important. And just the confusion with the leaderboards on the last day is really something that uh, isn't good look for you guys and for everybody else. All we ask for is a little bit of communication. And if you want to knock the leaderboards down for 10 hours or four hours or six hours, you're going to put everybody guessing what's going on. Just communicate. It's not that hard. I mean, we all ask for y'all to say shit and then y'all – just need to go ahead and just communicate with the people that are playing your game and the people that have an opportunity to make a live event, make an online tournament that never have been there before. And it's really important to continue to encourage these guys to play in MCS and play competitive men. So I think that's who they dropped the ball for. Not necessarily the pro players, the big name players that can make the leaderboard easy, easy, easily, because I think we can do that fairly easy. And we should have did that in the first week like I did, but... That's neither here nor there, but it just goes back to the lack of communication and the scheduling conflicts that we have had since the beginning of the MCS. And it's definitely something that, I mean, they seem to not be able to correct. You know, I think we need one person that's consistently communicating or one Twitter account. Obviously, I have the Twitter account. And one of my biggest problems with the Twitter account is it's such a small, they really, they really, I wish they promoted the MCS on their bigger Twitter accounts. And um, they don't. They have this new Madden League Ops, which to me is like they could turn it into, you know, 500,000 followers if they just promoted it more. If they wanted it to be that big, if they wanted to promote us that big, it would be a bigger Twitter account. That's something that we talk about a lot and that you know, I really wish they promoted MCS that, you know, on their main Twitter account or even on, you know, the Mutt Twitter account. These are huge accounts that so many kids see. And it could really help people grow. Like, T. Davis just won the first club series, man. And and I looked at it, and obviously he got a lot of love from the Cardinals, this, that, and the third. But I went back and looked at the Cardinals. They didn't really tweet him out. They didn't really promote. They promoted, we're ready for the man club series. And they didn't really push that to the next level. And obviously they promoted the hell out of it on the Madden League Ops. But there's like, seven, there's like I think, ten Madden players with more followers than Madden League Ops. And honestly, between me and you guys, I take a lot of responsibility in that because I feel like I ruined that personally. I feel like I'm the reason they have the Madden League Ops Twitter. I feel like I'm the reason they can't promote the MCS and other Madden players on their main accounts because they're afraid of, you know, the stuff that happened with me years ago happening to other people and them getting in more trouble by promoting other Madden players. So they have this smaller Twitter account to go ahead and promote the man player. So I feel like it's a lot of on my shoulders, and I, you know, ruin that for a lot of people. So it is what it is. I wish we, we obviously got better promotion. I think man players, I think that T. Davis won a huge tournament. You know, he put a lot of work into that. I feel like it should be celebrated more in the man community. So that's just something that how I feel, something that I wish was better in Madden. And, and that's what I thought Ultimate League was going to do. I thought Ultimate League was going to make us superstars. But that's neither here nor there. We had the rest of the year to figure that out and the rest of, you know, our main careers to figure it out and keep moving and keep growing. And it's not necessarily up to EA to keep us growing. You know, they did us part. They did their part. They gave us this platform. I wish they could do more. But, you know, I'm tired of asking them for help. I mean, we can do a lot on our own. But, like I said, we get back to T. Davis. T. Davis and the Arizona Club Series was crazy. A lot of things to talk about in this. I mean, I watched a lot of games. I hope you guys watch all the games. We're going to go over all the games because this is what I like to do. I like to nitpick people's Madden game. I like to tear them apart. I like to say what they did wrong, say what they did good, and really talk about it because this is what I love. I love to see how people react in certain situations. I love to see the decision-making behind what they do and, and, and always think, what would I do in that situation? Or what would the play I call? How would I play conservative? Would I play aggressive? Would I, you know, What would I do? You know, That's pretty much what I love to talk about. And I actually watched these games like four times. I have huge notes on, on every game. Actually, my notes are pretty much on the T. Davis versus Little Bird game. That game was probably obviously the game of the weekend. The other two games were blowouts. And I'm going to talk about the K-Mac game because there's some things I didn't like out of that, and I, we can talk about that too. But we're definitely going to talk about Little Burke. 
we're going to talk about a lot of decisions that were made in that game, neither bad or good or, or so on and so forth. And really, I mean, obviously the the, the pass to Chris Thompson off his face or off his shoulder pads that, that Chris Milton just – dove and picked off was the story of the game. I mean, whether it's – it was pretty bad. As much as – and you guys watch me play. I use um, what you call it, Todd Gurley running back at tight end all the time. And they had those problems. Like, obviously, they drop passes. They do, especially in traffic. That one wasn't in traffic. Although, he had dropped a couple of slants – or a couple of drags early in the game with the strip animation. But this one was definitely bad. It definitely was a glitch. It hit him off the back, and Milton dove and caught that. But as much as we could talk a whole show about that, if it could happen, you know, if <laughs> what they could do about plays like that is that should that be allowed or, or in a real esports when glitches like that happen and they cancel it, it's definitely something that can be talked about in, you know, in length about that play. But I just want to talk about the game in general. Typical game. I mean, you guys have watched Madden like this the entire year. 3-3-5 three, three, odd from both players. West Coast bunch from T. Davis. Very EMB-ish. And also, I mean, trips tight end from Lil Burke. The same thing we've been seeing all year. Motion in, inside zone. He had Ricky Williams. Salute to Ricky Williams. Ricky Williams won me a lot of money in Madden Bowl. I will always salute somebody that puts Ricky Williams in the backfield because he fights like none other. And he fought a lot. He actually, I mean, my man Burke scored a touchdown. First drive, third and ten. I know T. Davis was sick about this because I would have been sick about this defensively. Third and ten on like on like the twenty yard line, he ran an inside zone and scored a touchdown with Ricky Williams. Now the touchdown he scored, he could have scored with anybody because three three five odd gets pounded from time to time. But uh, he he definitely every fourth and one he had fourth and inches he gave the ball to Ricky. Boom, Ricky Williams. Ricky Williams definitely uh, really every fourth and one. And I'm sitting here watching because I watched the game live. I really did. And uh, I was definitely sitting here watching thinking, damn, is T. Davis going to run commit? But he was never put in a position where I thought a run commit was smart on them third and ones, especially because it was all he was always down or the game was tied when uh, my man Lil Burke had the ball. Oh, man. So, but like I said, every fourth down, Burke definitely ran inside his own. And he beat him. He, like I said, Chris Thompson definitely caught a big bomb on second and 20 for Burke, too. So, Bur- Chris Thompson lost him in the game, but he also put him in a huge position there to, to take the lead because he went up 14-7 off that bomb to Chris Thompson. I just want to go over a couple plays here. Griffin, we could bring this up. Let me see where we at over here. T. Davis versus Little Burke. Boom. Let's go. Shot. Also, another thing about EA. Shout out to my man Compton187, man. I really hope you're in the chat. I really hope you catch us on YouTube because this is something that is so easy to do. My man just rips the games. I don't know if he watches them live and then goes ahead and uh, and then just records it and then posts it. But whatever he does, he does a good job of it. And I really wish it was something EA did and promoted on their YouTube because this is like is golden. And I don't understand why. My Twitch not popping up. I don't understand why they don't do this at a bigger scale. They don't do this, you know, on their YouTube, whatever YouTube they may have, whatever, you know, whatever they got going on YouTube wise. I don't know why EA doesn't do this so you can have access to these games. But Compton187 has the community. He really does. So if you ever want to watch any old MCS game, any live event game, my man Compton187 has it down for you guys. But the main thing I want to look at here is. I want to look at the main decision that I want to talk about is, is T. Davis here. Oh, this is the KMAC game. Never mind. Pause this. The first decision I saw in this game that was pretty wild, and, and I understood it completely. This is this is a sack and then the bomb the next play, but I think it's coming up here. Now, T. Davis has the ball here. He gets the ball at half. Yes, yeah, so Compton really helps us out for, for real. He really is like... I don't, I don't understand why somebody EA can't do that and really promote Madden, but neither here nor there. Now, T. Davis has the ball here. Obviously, for me, first and 10 right now, I'm running the ball. I'm getting to the two-minute warning. I'm doing. I, I'm pretty sure that's what he does. See, I mean, this is pretty simple Madden here. Let me just get to the two-minute warning. I get the ball at half. I'm thinking to myself, 
even if I go ahead and score a, touch, a field goal here, I'm cool because I'm getting an automatic turnover. I'm getting a ball that has second and three is a big deal because I can get a first down. Pretty, He's in good position to, even though K-Mac has all three timeouts or uh, Lil Brick has all three timeouts, he's in good position here to run the clock out because it's second and three. Had he got the first down, it's way different situation. But what T. Davis does, I believe he goes ahead and, and pounds the ball here and he gets – he gets a first and goal early, like a first and goal real close to the goal line. I don't know. He does his little cur- his little wheel route that he does the running back a lot. We're going to talk about that later too. But now he- I would have called timeout if I'm a little break right there. I want to conserve as much time as possible because now I know that, I mean, if I call timeout there, T. Davis cannot run the clock out. But what he's going to do right here, this is a, for me personally, this is an obvious run commit situation. You know, I'm getting a ball at half. I want, I'm want. i cool with 14 to 10. I don't want it, but I'm cool with it. It's an obvious run commit situation. So what T. Davis does is he's going to come out here. I think this is the down he passed. Yeah, he passes. And he gets lurked, which is brutal, which is absolutely brutal that you get lurked there. But for me, it's an obvious run commit situation because if you're Little Burke, you want to get the ball back before the half. The worst case scenario of your little Burke is you don't get the ball back before half. So it's somewhere where I definitely would have ran commit because even if you score, bang, it's 14-14, but I have a whole minute and 22 seconds to go ahead and get the ball back. So that's pretty much what I would have been thinking defensively. So T. Davis thought about that. He said, I'm going to call a pass play. Now, obviously, he had a plan. He's going to throw this high ball. Didn't expect the guy to be on Dion and super lurk it. So that was a huge play, and honestly – if I'm T. Davis, I'm sick about that. One, because I didn't take any time off the clock. Two, obviously, I turned the ball over, so I don't have any points. Now he has the ball back. Yeah, I believe, because one, it didn't even look like a high pass. It's just Deion Sanders took it. So he had a plan, because that's the thing. Like, if you're going to be on the goal line and you're going to say, this guy might run commit, now you have to have a plan for if he doesn't run commit. You know, it's not just, oh, I'm going to snap the ball. If, if he run commits, I'll pass it. Obviously, fine, that's cool. But you have to have a plan for, okay, if he doesn't run commit, this is what I want to throw. Now, it's pretty wild. This play is pretty wild because, he, I mean, see a lot of people run this. It's the double post here. You got Will Ty running the post over the middle. He doesn't want to throw to Will Ty. He wants to throw to Herman Moore. What happens is, and obviously, he gets lurked right there. Boom. Great play by Lil Burke. I mean, that's why you have Deion Sanders. Now, this is where Little Burke, if Little Burke is going to win the Arizona Club Series, he has to score right now. He caught T. Davis, made a mistake, so he has to go down and score. Now, I don't remember exactly what happens, but I know he punched the ball. But honestly, turning the ball over there could have been killer. It it really took away that turnover he's going to get at halftime. But I believe Lil Burke comes out here and gets boxed, gets sacked like three times. T. Davis does use his timeouts to get the ball back which is great, obviously. See, he uses all time. I'll give him to a fourth and 14. Now, this is where – and Burke uses the, the the goofy camera. Now, I've never been a goofy cameraman. If you're a goofy cameraman at home, God bless you for being a goof. But he uses the goofy camera, man. Not a perfect punt. Returnable punt. This is a huge down right. This is huge. Obviously, he made him use his timeouts right here, so he can't stop the clock. So, if I'm T. Davis right now, you got to be looking for some type of curl flat, some type of deep corner route. There's no way – it's po- it's extremely hard to go ahead and – pause – to go ahead and, and get something in the middle of the field and go. Even if he, if he calls a, a seam down to like the 35, he might have time to call the field goal unit out. But it looks like he just went for the bomb post out of uh, deep corner and throw underneath pretty much nothing. Because you can take a play like that, now you only have one play to throw to the end zone. He no huddles, and he throws the ball away. So, obviously, obviously that's not exactly – when. When you throw the pick inside the goal line, you throw the pick inside the goal line there or inside the five, boom, you just ruined your chances of being 14-10 or 14-14. You're still down seven even though you get ball back. But because you bagged a little Burke, you can go ahead and, and try to score points. And the not score points there is a little bit disappointing, even though it was a super tough spot to score points. It was definitely tough to get points there. It would have been almost impossible to get points there. But so anyway, T. Davis go ahead and get the ball out of half. And what he does is he goes, I believe he goes right down the field and he scores. So another thing I want to talk about, another amateur, amateur, amateur thing that Burke did that he got to learn from this. We got to get to it. T. Davis goes down the field. This is how oh, this ain't it right here. 
No, 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 no. This is Burke with the ball. Fourth inches, he gave the ball to Ricky Williams. Smart man, gave the ball to Ricky Williams every time he had a chance. This is what I want to criticize right here, and I'm, I'm going to do this second on one here, boys, okay? Now, if I'm a little bit, I'm sick about this, and you guys are going to learn something about this. Because second and one, one, I hate goal line offense, man. I, I don't think I'm going to run another goal line offense snap this year. But I said so T. Davis loves this shit, and I, I honestly I don't understand. But Burke, for some reason, comes out in this 3-4. You know, I, I, I hate this 3-4. Comes out in 3-4. Okay, he pinches the line. It might stop quarterback sneak. But if I'm, t- I'm thinking, T.D., I'm second and one, I, you got to show me you can stop quarterback sneak because this doesn't look like it's, it's not goal line. I don't think it's going to stop it. And boom, it doesn't really stop it. And I fall for Now, right here, t- this is exactly what I would have did. No huddle. Boom. Now, Burke is in the shittiest quarterback sneak defense in the world. Now, let me pause it. And- you have to go off sides right here if you're little Burke. I, as as much as I, T. Davis went up and down the field on this man, he really did. He went up and down on the field, this man. And as bad as somebody's whooping your ass and killing you, and you can't stop them, it's hard as shit to score down here. But if you're gonna run that for quarterback sneak defense, if I I tell you a million times, T. Da- T. Davis is super happy right now. He is like, please, please, hey, 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 hey. He's trying to snap the ball to get an easy touchdown. I don't know why a human being. Why would you call time? All you have to do right now. After he no huddles this, because uh, this isn't the, the first one, second one, this isn't the best quarterback sneak defense. It's not. I don't care what you labbed up. It's just come out in any goal line play, and quarterback sneak is not an option. But he's in 3-4. He gets the first down with the quarterback sneak. So then he no huddles, which is what every, every sane Madden player in the world would do, you know, because now I got first and going to one. You're in this shit defense. I can go ahead and score. Now all you have to do defensively is go off sides. Run encroachment, run anything, because he's already at the, the half-yard line or, or, the, or the yard line. All that's going to do is move him half the distance. So half half of six inches is three inches. Half, half of a yard is, is, is a half a yard. It doesn't make a difference if you can come out – if it gives you the opportunity to come out in the right defense. Exactly. It, that half a yard difference from going off sides doesn't matter if you come out in the right goal line defense. But allowing somebody to score an easy touchdown inside the yard, inside the two, is devastating. It's just little things you have to do. And Bert just said in the chat, I wanted to call a timeout. There's no need to call a timeout. That half yard is not worth a timeout. Honestly, in the second half, you, you, you would rather give up a touchdown to T. Davis than call a timeout. Seriously, it's just a bigger deal. And we're going to come and we're going to see how, one, timeouts come back to bite you in the ass if you use them. And two, how Burke was not prepared to call timeout on the PlayStation to the Xbox converter. He was not prepared for it. It cost him time. We're going to come down to that in a minute. And it, honestly, it disappointed me. You know what I'm saying? It, it, just little things like this that you guys can learn from. You, know, you can go off sides right here. It doesn't hurt you at all to go off sides right here. What hurts you is being in bad quarterback sneak defense or bad goal line defense. But that, that, that's pretty much what I got from Lil Burke doing that there. So then he allows T. Davis to go ahead and get a, get a little score. Okay. T. Davis is happy as shit. He like this sigh of relief. <sighs> he wishes he had that three he threw a pick on. He really wishes that. But the game is tied. Now, essentially, Lil Burke does his job in the next drive. He really does. He just chips away and chips away and chips away and chips away. And just... <laughs> He really does do a good job of going down the field. Every fourth down he got to, he ran inside zone. And that's and and, and because there's so much time left, that's why I was thinking, is T. Davis ever going to run commit his his trips to his trips tight end? Which is hard to run commit. But you see him just bringing people. He knows he's going to go ahead and run inside zone. And, and it's hard to stop, especially when he does this motion in here. Third and one, he doesn't run it there. Like maybe, maybe a run commit option. But he gets a drop right there from Fuller. And this is where I was thinking T. Davis might run commit right here. Because he's it, he's just shown every time it's a fourth and down, a fourth and short, it's gonna get a ball to Ricky, and that's why you pay Ricky. And like I said, but in, in prior, when the podcast started, I'm not mad at that. Ricky Williams is the man. He's where he's the mutt, whatever he is. He's the man. You see, he gets to a fourth and one. Now time is becoming a big issue now, especially the way he's playing. He's getting little yards, little yards, run, run, run. He can take 30 seconds off the clock every time. Gets the block there. Almost looked like he was going to sh- shoot that gap right there. Almost like he was going to shoot it. It was pretty wild. 
So, shoot. I mean, but he gets him here. Uh, I'll snap. Here we go. Beautiful, beautiful Nerd Street internet right here. Jesus. Jesus. But anyway, he was stop he was trying to stop this inside zone and it was really hard to stop. Out of that look. You gotta say, well uh, yeah, this is just amazing. Guy's got all the internet tools in the world. Let's see. That little burke. Let's see if we go from here. End of the scuba story. Rock don't want to show up no more, man. He gave up. Oh, this is the – oh, here we're right back. Jeez. Next play, he gets sacked, which is obviously great for T. Davis, but it knocks him back. It, it's just more time off the clock. So, T. Davis is thinking, man, this game is getting short. It really is. The game is getting short really quick, and I think this is the, the infamous play right here, honestly. This is the play that changes. This is the play they're talking about for years. It's a great setup, though. Because he has a high-low read on the right, and T. Davis has to guard B. Thumps it all, boom, 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 and there it is, Milton. Now, I'm, I, T. Davis was clicked on here, but, man, it's crazy to think that someone would be holding Y to pick that off at that time. Because if I'm T. Davis right here, I'm definitely clicking. I'm definitely clicking strip. I'm stripping the hell out of this running back with Milton. That's what I'm clicking. I'm jamming the hell out of RB button. I'm RB, and maybe there I hit Y. But, ah, oh man, I just – I want to say Madden did it for him. I want to say it out there, chat. I want to put it out there and say Madden did it, did it off him. I'm RB. RB, 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 RB. Then maybe Y on some bullshit. But I'm jamming RB. That's what I'm doing. A huge play right there. Obviously, if you're Lil Burke, you're devastated because you had a dot. I mean, you you probably might have got, you know, six to eight yards on that. Got you to a third and long. Where, honestly, where's he at again? This is a second and 20, but he's on, he's on in midfield. So two baby dots, even if you don't – two baby dots, even if you don't get into uh, – even if you don't get the first down, you'll get back into field goal range. You know, so you're thinking after you'll do this baby dot, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm halfway into field goal range because – Really like the 35 is field goal range. He catches this here at the 45. He might, you know, it is Milton. Milton might have missed the tackle, so he could have got halfway, man. I mean, he could have won the game so, other t so many other times. Obviously, this play is devastating. It's pretty much cooked for you right now because you're in such a tough spot right here. Such a tough spot to go ahead and get a stop, and that's what you need to do. And, and T. Davis knows if I get one, if I get one first down, this game is cooked. You know, and this I mean, I can't believe they replayed it, but it's definitely a little glitchy drop. I I go drags to my tight end running back all the time. Never really seen that animation, especially for his back, him turn around and smack it in the air. I don't know much. So you see T. Davis knows, let me run some clock. This game is over. I have Leonard Fournette for a reason. And the one thing I love about watching T. Davis play all weekend was it he, he when he milked, he milked. It wasn't skim milk. It wasn't almond milk. It wasn't soy milk. It was vitamin D. You caught that bitch at the half second. He snapped it the half second every time. He let it go to one and then snapped it. He didn't wait. He didn't snap it three or four. You caught the real milk. And that's that's. And you'll see here, it doesn't matter here because he's not going to get it under 30 seconds. But then two plays, he can get to the two-minute warning. So, so it's almost worth, worth a pass here. Scrambles with Vic. Boom. He knows the next play is going to take him. This is a huge play in the game. And this play right here, this play right here is probably the play of the game uh, because Little Burton, you got to know that, boom, if I stop him here, he's kicking his field goal, I'm going to get the ball back. I'm going to have to get into my timeouts if he gets this first down. And this is why you have Michael Vick. He plays the, great, the best defense you could play. Double flash the right side. He's been running stick or, or he's run stick – or mesh post pretty much every play, flipped, and just different route combinations. So I'm going to get into that. Before, pretty much now I'm going to get into that. So on this third and five, he played great defense right here. You know, because T, all TV Davis did was flip bunch around. And like goes, and it's, it's just annoying. You just want to smack some, like just make up your mind. And honestly, sometimes I think they don't even make up their mind. They don't even know what they want to do. But 
like I said, on third and five for the game. Third and five for the game. Like I said, he goes double flats on the right. He puts the, because T. Davis had hit him with this seam a couple times. He puts the safety right here, over here in the third, up the middle. That's not an option. That's not an option. That's not an option. The crossing route is not an option. But to me, for the Chaloops, you got to spy Michael Vick. And, and the thing is, people who play with Vick and they'll say, oh, I don't scramble, right? I mean, Vick's left-handed. But it's for one play. If you can have the scrambler, even if it matters for one play, it matters. You know, it's worth to have Michael Vick. And obviously, this was great defense. I think defending bunch is picking the right defense at the right time. My man Little Burke picked, picked the perfect defense at the right time, just didn't spy Vic, and he gets burnt by it. just a little bit more. And, and I mean, that's, that's one of the plays of the game. So now I'm going to go to one of T. Davis, obviously. Like I said, it was pretty much stick to the wide side or it was mess post. And pretty much this game, if you're going to use – if you're going to use West Coast Playbook, which obviously is still good, Bunch is still good, I don't want to get into that. This is not a why is Bunch so good podcast. This is a how many times how many times can you run mesh posts differently? That's pretty much if you run if you run West Coast, your thought process on offense is how many different ways can I run mesh post? And there was a way that he ran mesh post in this game that really really killed Lil Burke. It killed him all day. I'm going to be honest with you, pretty much everything T. Davis did killed Little Burke. He did. I mean, if I mean, obviously the, the game came down to that pick. You know, Little Burke could have easily won this game if he didn't have a pick and gotten the field goal range. A, little, a couple things went differently for him. He was never out of the game. But defensively, I really thought he – I mean, I really thought T. Davis played a great game. I was really impressed the way he, he played offense this game. And the main thing, it's just about mesh post. How many different ways can you run mesh post? And he really killed him with this one this one setup. And that's when I took down in my notes pretty much was just a little hitch on his inside receiver. We'll see here. A little hitch on his inside receiver and then the post. So pretty much he puts that, you know, he puts that bind on your user. Are you going to cover the hitch or are you going to cover the post? Here it is. He drops back to the post, hits the hitch. Now, he doesn't get the best animation right here. But you see the, the, just the, the concept of the play. And the next play, he's going to come back to the same thing. That's why I call about calling plays out a bunch. How many different ways can you call the play? How many different ways can you run mesh post? And that's pretty much what it came down to. Here he runs the same play, the same exact setup, but just flipped. This time he guards the hitch, and boom, throws the post. It's pretty much because you're already in 3 through 5 you're blitzing many people. Bunch puts as much stress on your flats as possible, so you have to have a flat on both sides. It's pretty much making the user cover both the hitch and the post, and that's definitely – you know, one that he used to perfection all game. There's definitely a couple other times where he used it. Hmm. Let me see my notes. 21-10, he used it. Looks like the next player here. He's just moving the ball down the field. As you see, A for 11, that pick inside the five really killed him. He's going to use mesh post again. Now, I remember at the end of last year, I was good at flipping bunch and making hot routes. Not so good at it now. It's definitely something that and, – and because he doesn't block anybody, he still has the option to go ahead and dump it off here to Will Ty. Still keeps that flat route. What that flat route will do too is take all them flat zones, all them purple zones all the way out of the way so the, the hitch is even more wide open. So all that being said, what we're going to do here is we're going to fast forward to after that third and five play. We're going to show the third and five play again because this is definitely – Definitely a spot in the game where, where you know, champions are born. So you got to know how to execute these plays. Obviously, we went over this play a thousand times. Michael Vick goes ahead and makes this play. Takes it to the two-minute warning. Now, Lil Burke has three timeouts left. Me, I'll probably use my timeouts for the rest. I got to stop him right now. He can, if he gets another first down, I lose this game, period. He already got one first down, but because I have three timeouts, I can get the ball back. I got – Lord Jesus. Griff, what's up? All this internet, all this all this files. Jesus. Two 
to Davis as YouTube. Clef, what's up, man? No, but like I said, after that, oh, Jesus Christ. After that first down, now you got to use your timeouts. Where are we at here? Come on, YouTube. Boom. So you get a first down here. Boom. Now I got to get all thank, – thanks, Rob. I appreciate you. But anyway, after we get this first down, now if I'm – I got to get into my timeouts because that's the only way I get the ball back is if I get into my timeouts. So if I'm – oh, Jesus. Griff, this is amazing work. Where is that? Oh. What's the best defensive formation? The best defensive formation is, is to me, is still dollar. So Mozilla is great right here, uh, Griff. Amazing. Quality. Yeah, I'm off of Mozilla. I've given up. Chrome is going to fight for us. Boom. All right, we're back. So, like I said, all right, perfect. So, obviously, T. Davis runs right here. Boom. Again, I'm calling timeout right away. And what happens is this is the craziest part is that Burke tries to call timeout. Because any – I'm calling timeout. He he goes to call timeout. Now, the biggest problem, he'll tell you this, this is, this is amateur hour. And we tell a lot of people – you know, playing in a big lights, being prepared is more than just, you know, knowing how to block 3-3-5 odd, knowing how to defend bunch, knowing how to run the ball and all this. You got to be prepared to play with a, with a uh, Xbox controller. You got to be prepared to play with a converter. And Lil Burke was not prepared to play with a converter. He did not know the timeout button. That is what – and they never mentioned this in the stream because they didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what was going on at the time. But what happens is he doesn't call timeout because he doesn't know the button. Now, he would have called timeout at 157. You see he gets this pause at 144. So he gets this pause, I don't know the button. I don't know how to call timeout. That That's pretty much what, what it is. You know, now Chow comes over and says, you know, you got to hit this button, that button. Now, what's crazy after this, he doesn't need to use his timeout. And if Lil Berg's in the chat, you can tell, did they make you use the timeout? Because if I already waste 15 seconds off the clock because of that, I'm not going to use my timeout. I'm going to go ahead and let that 30 seconds run off the clock, let him run again, then get into my timeouts. Because I don't necessarily need to use a timeout in that situation. I would like to, but because I didn't know the button, they already let 15 seconds run off the clock. So I'm going to go ahead and let another 15 seconds run off the clock. My timeouts are so valuable at this time of the game that they're not worth 15 seconds. The timeouts are worth a whole 30 seconds. They definitely are at this time. So I'm going to let another 15 seconds run out the clock. And what's interesting is instead of calling the timeout 157, now when they get done talking, this guy, and, and shout out to the Bible right here, Farrells, great guy, great commentator. But see, as you come back here, he's at 140 and he has his timeout gone. So I want to know, did they make him use the timeout? Did he still want to use the timeout? Because if it's me, and I let what pretty much, because when T when that play was stopped, it was like 157 left. Period. So I might, instead of it, and we're talking about 16, 17 seconds. That's a big deal in a game of Madden. Big deal, especially down in this situation. So for me personally, I wouldn't have used the timeout if I didn't know. I would go ahead and let the clock run. So now we get to here. We get to the next play. Boom. He runs again, obviously. He has Leonard Fournette. Boom. Okay. Now he uses timeout right away. So he's stuck with one timeout. Has to get off the field here.
has to or he won't get the ball back. Game is over. He pretty much has one dot, and we, we talked about this play all day. This is the play. I, he's going to go to the same setup. You know, he's been getting killed by mesh post with a hitch, mesh post with a hitch. So what is Burke going to defend? Mesh, and this is the sneakiest dot where he sneaks out his running back over here in the, with the wheel route and out route, falls down, secures the bag. So that's pretty much where he used mesh post with a, with a hitch, mesh post with a hitch. He finally ran the same setup but went back to the quick out route with the running back wheel on mesh post, was able to hit that for the dot. The first time he's doing that pass all day, he kept Lil Burke over there with the hitch in the post. Boom. So now he's going to let the clock run because he's thinking now, how can I use my timeout to ice this field goal? And that's what I would be thinking. But if we add those 17 seconds onto this play now with his one timeout, it changes it drastically. Now, he either has those 17 seconds if he knows how to press the pause button or, or if he doesn't even call the timeout and he has another whole, he another, he has another whole timeout to use. So we're talking he either has 17 more seconds or a whole another timeout. If he has a whole another timeout in this situation, it changes it drastically. So T. Davis does, I mean, the whole thing blew up now, but it's cool. So what T. Davis does, honestly, what he does is he goes ahead and takes a knee Boom. And what any, any any smart man player would do, comes out and field goal on third down. That's what it does. Boom. Comes out on third and field down. Blah, blah. Comes out and field goal on third down. So that's able to go ahead and, and he can't get ice. Or he makes Lil Burke use his last timeout. Then T. Davis comes out and field goal to win the game. Now, this is field goal to win the entire thing. I don't need no more. I'm good. You ain't got to worry about it. Bro. Yeah, I'm good. I don't, I don't need it no more. I can just talk. The people just want to hear me talk anyway. So then T. Davis comes out. Third down, Burke calls his timeout, boom. After Burke calls his timeout, T. Davis comes back out in field goal. And this is T. Davis. I mean, obviously, I mean, <sighs> T. Davis has been around a long time. Now, I'm talking since he was a little kid, and he's played a lot of man. He's played a lot of man to prepare for this tournament, and he does the, one of the biggest amateur things he can do. <laughs> he comes out. He gets rid of the ice, kicks the field goal, but decides, you know what? First of all, it's a short field goal. He only kicks half power or third power, which is what I would probably do as well. But he decides, you know, I'm T. Davis. I'm too cool. I don't have to hold this. I don't have to hold this. You know, I can just kick it right away. Like, like it. And a lot of times, even I get in the problem with this, we kick so many extra points, so many field goals, that it just becomes a habit. A, 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 boom. That's pretty – just habit to kick the ball, kick the ball, kick the ball. But like I said, he just comes out there, kicks the ball, no power, doesn't get it perfect. Boom, I can just do whatever. It doesn't hold it. And Little Burke comes around the edge to block it. Now, God bless, I mean, I, the heart drop that one T. Davis had right away, Little Burke said, oh, I got, a, I got a chance. Then he dives and misses it, and then just the hearts flip the other way. T. Davis just a giant sigh of relief, and, and Burke was probably devastated. And just little things. T. Davis got to hold that. You got to hold. If you don't go for full power on a kick, you have to hold it at least 10 seconds or just some amount of time. You can't click it instantly. That's what T. Davis did. Should have got blocked and it would have got. And, and honestly, as much as we all hate field goal blocks, there's not a competitive player that thinks field goal blocks should be in the game. It's definitely a sim thing. It's something Rex and them th thought up to make the game more interesting or more fun for the kids. And, um, we don't like it, but it's in the game. So we got to adapt to the game. And if T. Davis field goal would have got blocked and returned for a touchdown, he would have lost on that. He could have only blamed himself because you got to hold that field goal. You got to hold it once you get the get the uh, accuracy right. And he didn't hold it. That's why he got the block animation, but he didn't block it. So, boom, that's pretty much how it was. But he was able to win that game. It was the best game of the weekend. A lot of controversy on that drop pick by Milton. But, I mean, that's why you put Milton on the field, man. If you don't have a Milton, get yourself a Milton. I remember in my stream uh, a couple months ago I said, let's all post Milton for like 2,000 coins or 20,000 coins, and you assholes are still posting them up there for 800 coins. Milton is worth so much. But by now every competitive player has three or four Miltons. I know I have three or four Miltons, so if you need a Milton, hit me up. I'll, I'll, I'll give them to you for a cool 20K or something like that. But – I mean, that that was a great game. It was great to watch, great to see little little things people did differently towards the end and the way they handled themselves under pressure and the way they really uh, performed. And I, like I said, T. Davis, I really thought he was um he was impressive passing the ball. When you're using West Coast, it's pretty much how many different ways can you run mesh post, and he ran it very well. But And that's all my entire notes for that T. Davis was a little Burke. If I'm Burke, I'm sick about the drop, definitely sick about the drop, um, the drop, 
drag into a pick turnover in the game. But but if I look back at it, the the biggest drive that I had was 14 to seven. I picked him off in the end zone. I stopped him from getting points. When he was up 14 seven, two minutes left. He had all his timeouts. You got to go down there and get some type of points. If you can go up 17 seven at halftime, it, it's really demoralizing to your opponent and really a boost boost for you. So if you look back at anything he could have done differently, it would definitely be that. That drive before half was definitely the one where he, he needed to go up two scores. You know, for T. Davis to throw that pick, turn around, and get a stop and get the ball back. He didn't score any points, but he definitely got a stop. Went to half 14-7, to seven, was able to score out of half and tie the game up, get that fortunate bounce that we all need. you got to put yourself in position to get the fortunate bounces, and he did. So, that's said, it was a great game. I also wanted the final game, K-Mac versus T. Davis. T. Davis said on the announcement, he said, listen, man, K-Mac blew me out to get here. He ran something I didn't really expect. He ran something new, so I really prepared for it. So, to me, I, I mean, I was interested in watching the game. Obviously, I've, I've played K-Mac. He, he's a little wild, a little different. You always like somebody a little different, man. It's cool. It's cool to watch. And people say this is what's going to make Madden grow is people running different schemes. But, I mean, for me personally, I mean, if everybody runs it, they all run it for a reason. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. You know, it's a gift and a curse. Obviously, it, it might catch somebody slipping the first time. The first time you run, you might catch a win or, 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 you know, you might sneak up on somebody. But Bunch is good for a reason. All the pro players run this for a reason. 55 odd is good for a reason. Now, K-Max defense was something else. And you saw early against T. Davis. T. Davis actually got the ball first, and he got bagged. He ran twice. Draw got him to a third and eight. He snapped, and he just came back and got sacked by the two bummy ends. Obviously, see. K-Mac was going for a shed defense, and that's something that, that boxed T. Davis right away, but T. Davis punted the ball. And all he did, all game, he pretty much ran cover three, four-man rush, hoping for the loop. The loop never really even came in versus K-Mac. It was just Lawrence Taylor fought, and K-Mac really looked lost against just cover three, cloud flats, lurk in the middle of the field. And I talked to K-Mac afterwards, and he said, I was really more prepared for people sending five and six at me. One, and I'm assuming that's what T. Davis did on their own online game when he said K-Mac blew him out. So I saw T. Davis was really more prepared for some for uh, K. Max offense. He really came prepared for the the spread with everybody going over the middle. He kept the three wreck in the middle of the field. He put hook curls. He lurked the middle of the field. There was nowhere really to throw. And we also talked about that game. Is K. Max did throw a lot of corner routes to the bummy receivers that did not catch the ball. He got unfortunate probably three or four times with deep corner routes that hit his receiver in the back. His receiver didn't get his feet in. You know, it's things that could have swayed the game. You know, if K-Mac catches a couple of those 20, 30-yard passes, boom, he gets a field goal. Now now he puts a little more pressure on T. Davis. See, T. Davis, did. I don't even think he completed a pass in this game. He just played defense, and he just ran the ball. He had Leonard Fournette, and because K-Mac did not score, T. Davis didn't have to pass the ball. It's not necessarily that T. Davis or uh, K-Mac didn't have run defense. It was more so that K-Mac couldn't score. So if my opponent can't score, why would I risk passing the ball? Why I would just keep pounding it, giving the ball to Leonard Fournette because you have shown you can't score, and you have shown that you know I'm going to go ahead and and just keep running the ball because you can't score, and and eventually I'm going to pop a run. And T. Davis did went up seven nothing, just kept playing defense. So the one thing about it, I was disappointed in how K. Mac put his routes on the field, even though he did drop hella passes on the sideline. But the main people he was doing to pass to the sideline was John Ross and Will Fuller. And I said, I, I told I talked to him, I said, man, I wish you had, you know, better wide receivers. They seemed like that was the main part you were trying to throw the ball to was these two slot receivers running corner routes. And he said he was confident with who we had. But, I mean, John Ross and Will Fuller really let him down that game, made it that much harder to keep passing the ball because, obviously, if Fuller and Ross are going to go ahead and drop these these touchdowns, you're going to have a problem, you know, or drop these big corner routes, you're going to have a problem. And then next time you drop back, you're not going to be so sure to throw them the ball, even though that's probably the biggest play you have in your offense. If they continue to drop it or step out of bounds and so on and so forth, then you're going to have to think twice when you drop back to throw the ball to Will Fuller. So that was pretty much the big thing. Another big play, T. Davis did not play good offense that game. He got bagged, and he actually had a punt. I wish I could show you guys this, but he actually had a punt that pinned, pinned K-Mac inside the five-yard line. We talk about pro players all the time. It's it's a misconception that we want to we don't punt the ball. You know, sometimes when you notice you're playing a player that you feel like you got the bag, they're not going to move the ball. You know, when you're not playing the best offense in the world, go ahead and punt the ball. And T. Davis actually punt him inside the five. This is when it was seven nothing. It was still a game. Punt him inside the five. And what happened was T. Davis actually made him go three and out, 
and K Mac being like three minutes left or under two minutes left, K Mac had all three timeouts, so he went for a fourth down on his own seven yard line, which we agree with because it was the only way K Mac was probably going to get the ball back. If you punt from your own seven, you're probably going to get the ball to the 50 maybe. So that's pretty much in field goal range already. But if you turn the ball over on the 10 yard line or the seven yard line, it's just as easy for, or it's just as hard to score a touchdown from the 10 as it is to score from the 50. So after he after he punted the ball, yeah, after, well, T. Davis punted him inside the 10. K. Mac went for it on fourth down, didn't get it. And what happened was that punt, that great punt that T. Davis had, allowed him to stop him on fourth downs, get right back inside the 10 yard line. And T. Davis was able to run the clock out and kick his field goal up 10 nothing at half. That was huge. That was a big deal. So that's pretty much um, pretty much one of the plays of the game was a punt. You back him up there, and then you go up your two scores. K. Mac had a huge drop. I believe it was Will Fuller again. This, for some reason, his best, his worst wide receivers were catching all his big passes. And it's something. If I'm running a four wide receiver set, and, and you know I'm going to put this is my offense is four wide receivers. I'm going to put my money in my wide receivers. You know whether it be Moss. Whether, I think he had Tyreek Hill. He had Tyreek Hill, Hilton, John Ross, and Will Fuller. First of all, you need Randy Moss on the field at all times. I would have put more money in my uh, in my wide receivers if I was him. The other thing that K Mac had that was just mind blowing. He had Drew Brees at quarterback. Now I, Drew Brees obviously he's having another great year. He's going to be a top five quarterback of all time, but he's not a top fifty five quarterback in the history of Madden. I, I would have a breath of fresh air if someone brings Drew Brees on my field. You know, I feel like – I mean, and, and we went back to what T. Davis did on defense. He just rushed four people, two cloud zones, a three-wreck or a hook curl, and his user. The whole game. That, that was it. Nothing special. Now, me, if I see that, Michael Vick is getting 10 yards every play until you spy him. Okay, so now you spy him. Okay, one, you take away your rush. Two, you take away your coverage, one or the other. By having a 55-speed quarterback, T. Davis doesn't have to put a spy. He doesn't have to sacrifice his coverage. He doesn't have to sacrifice his rush. And this is why a mobile quarterback is so important, and I think it's astronomically stupid to go into a Madden game without that weapon on your offense. And I saw it all day from K. Mac. I mean, he, I, I'm, you don't know how bad I am at Madden. The, my first read a lot of plays is, can I take off with Vic? And if T- K. Mac had Vic, he would have had 150 yards. Or, like I said, he would have made T. Davis switch his defense, spy Lawrence Taylor, spy a flat zone, open up a drag, open up a flat route to get 20 yards instead of getting four yards. And that's something that I really came to watch and really see, like, you know, everybody should have a mobile quarterback. It's just that extra weapon the defense has to account for. So, one, he doesn't have a mobile quarterback. Two, he has shitters at wide receiver. Not going to be the best offense you could possibly have on the field. And if I'm running spread, I want the best offense possible. Especially if I'm running an offense with only one blocker, I want a mobile quarterback. But K-Mac was there for a reason. Drew Brees obviously held him down for the most part. So that was one of some of the observations I took in from the last game. And congratulations to T. Davis, man. He played smart. And that's when I went to the game with T, uh, K-Mac was really when I realized T. Davis was really out there giving the milk. It was no half ass milk. Like I said, it was no almond, no soy. The milk that T. Davis gave out there was straight from the cow, straight from the udder, just straight milk. Took that bitch all the way down to one second. That's something I really pray that all you guys take learn from, man. If you're going to milk somebody, milk them the right way. I mean, really take it down to one second because every second matters. We saw that coming to play with the Burke and T. Davis game. Every second matters. Now, you guys are telling me the Vikings Club Series got postponed. I don't know that. All I did was look at the old schedule they posted that was supposed to be the next Club Series. So, But since you guys told me it got postponed, I'm not going to get into that. Because, obviously, uh, it's for another podcast and another time. So, let's get into the devastating news that is Week 7 in the NFL. <sighs> the Eagles let down a 17-point lead in the fourth quarter. I don't know what happened. I mean, they were kicking the, the shit out of the Carolina Panthers. It was bad. I, the game was over for me. I was like, we're back in the Super Bowl form. We blow out the Giants, which isn't hard to do. I'm not saying anything about it. The Giants are horrible. But then we come back, we're blowing out the Panthers. The Panthers can't get a first down. They can't complete a pass. They can't stop the Eagles. They can't cover Ertz or Alshon is just doing whatever they want. Then I, I, don't, I, I, I couldn't even tell you guys what happened. I mean, 
obviously as a man player, you want to uh, go ahead and if you have a 17-point lead, you're going to sit on the ball. You're going to let them throw the ball underneath, tackle them, take 20, 25, 30 seconds off the clock every play. And I was cool with that. Watching the game, I'm like, okay, I'm cool. You know, let them throw the ball underneath. That's cool. You know, the, every every play, as, as I'm a man player, every play in a real football game, I'm thinking, oh, that's 30 seconds off the clock. Boom, okay, let them catch that drag. It's 30 seconds off the clock. There's two plays in the game that, that killed me. Well, three kind of killed me because that reverted. The first touchdown – it was 17-0 the first touchdown. It was a reverse, and boom, he got an end zone. Congratulations. Okay, it's 17-6. to They missed the extra point, 17-6. to I feel fine. Then they get the ball back, and we allowed them to throw a post down the middle of the field for like 40 yards. That's that's what you can't have. That's how comebacks happen. Obviously, if a team is going to make this wild comeback and throw four- and five-yard passes all the time, God bless them. But the Eagles gave up a post down the middle of the field and I hate Eagles Twitter. I, fo- I start following a lot of Eagles fans, and I swear these people are just clueless. We can't win. We're running prevent. Prevent doesn't allow a post route down the middle for 40 yards. Also, prevent does not allow the next play for a guy to get double moved on the outside. Boom, touchdown. So in two plays, we're in the end zone. We do a post down the middle. Boom. Then we do a double move on the outside. Boom. So they allow him to score a touchdown really fast. Also, the offense, then the offense had chances to go ahead and uh, end the game, and they really didn't. They really didn't get it done, and and Carson Wentz, is, you know, that's the first person you point to because he's the best player on the team. But that's neither here nor there. The Eagles definitely choked. We're looking. I still like us to win the division. We're three and four now. The Redskins are four and two. Like us to beat them twice. Even that out. We gotta go six and zero oh in the division. If we want to win the division, you gotta beat everybody in the division. Speaking of the division, the Cowboys. Another hysterical game. Came all down to one field goal kicker. I did think the Cowboys got cheated on that call on the the, fall, the snap infraction. You see a lot of centers do that. We'll just play with the ball a little bit, make them jump, pause, make, make, the, <laughs> make the defensive line jump. And it worked, you know, but they called, they, they called the center for the snap infraction. Tough call, but your NFL field goal kicker, you still got to kick the field goal. He clanks it off the, off the upright. Great ending for for somebody like me that loves to laugh at the Cowboys. So what do the Cowboys do after losing that game? I believe the Cowboys are three and four now, or two and four. One, I think they're three and four. So the Cow after losing that game, they decide it's cool to trade their first round pick for Amari Cooper. I feel like if it's something you feel like you need, God bless. I mean, I, Amari Cooper obviously is probably falling out of super favor with the Raiders if they're going to trade him. But to give up a first-round pick is a big, a big sacrifice to your future. But if they feel like Mark Cooper is somebody that can really help them, I think that is their biggest weakness is wide receiver on the outside. I mean, they thought Allen Hearns was going to be good for him, and uh, they got this young kid Gallup, who's fast. But ultimately, first-round pick for uh, Amari Cooper, the Raiders had to snap their hands and, and go get that. So the Raiders now have tons of first-round picks. It certainly looks like Gruden has just won a clean house and rebuild over there in Oakland. I'm not sure I don't pay that much attention to the Oakland Raiders, but they're looking really bad, looking like they're really tanking and really trying to stockpile some draft picks, a trust-the-process type of situation there for the Raiders. I mean, the other story we got to talk about is Justin Tucker. Justin Tucker missing an extra point to send the game into overtime. That's crazy. I think he was 222 out of 222 extra points before that. Best kicker in the NFL, bar none, he, he is the best. But, I mean, everybody's due to miss something. You know, that was a great game. The Saints are really looking tough. They go ahead and beat the Ravens on the road. Now, we forget about the Saints because they went and got blown out by the Buccaneers in week one. They got shocked, surprised, and, and Fitzpatrick really put it on them. But since then, the Saints have been playing some lights out football and probably probably the second best team in the NFL or the NFC right now behind the Rams. The Rams are just lights out as well. But, but it probably goes Rams and Saints if you want to talk about the N- NFC uh, power rankings. So those are two teams I'm looking forward to watch play. And, you know, Drew Brees is just – it's no way you can watch Drew Brees and not have him in your top five all the time. I think obviously Brady and Joe, Joe Montana, Peyton Manning. But after those three, I feel like Drew Brees got to be right there. I mean, when it's all said and done, Drew Brees is going to have every passing record and a Super Bowl. I mean, how can you argue with that? You know, I don't know why we really overlook Drew Brees. Maybe it's because, you know, obviously he's in the dome and he's always passing the ball, he's always had bad defenses, always always in shootouts, trying to come from behind and 
but we really kind of overlook how great Drew Brees is, and maybe because he doesn't have the huge playoff performances that Aaron Rodgers or uh, Tom Brady have. But Drew Brees certainly, obviously, is one of the best quarterbacks of all time, and we're lucky to have watched Drew Brees. And the Saints look really strong right now. I mean, like I said, they're probably the second-best team in the NFC right now. Hope the Eagles can get back into that, and we we move up the NFC. And another great game, hope you guys watched, was the Bears and the Patriots. The Patriots keep rolling, just finding ways to win. I mean, I don't think they were great that day. They had two special teams touchdowns which obviously we know in Madden are devastating. In real life, they're even more devastating. So, but, I mean, the Bears look good. They have their young quarterback, and that's really what it's about, man. If you have a young quarterback that can make plays, it's really something that can uh, propel your team. You have a young quarterback that you're not paying a lot of money, so you can go ahead and pay the Khalil Max. You can pay the Allen Robinsons. You can pay all these new uh, free agents to come to your team and go ahead and perform, and that's something the Bears are dealing with right now. And, I mean, it's great for them to see if they can keep rolling, see if they can sneak in the playoffs. I think the wild card is going to be a mess between the Panthers, obviously the Falcons trying to fight back into it. Obviously, we have the Packers, Vikings, boom. And then the NFC East slop between the Cowboys and the Redskins and the Eagles. So the wild card is going to be crazy. I think either the Packers or the Vikings will take a wild card spot. Then you got to kind of look to the NFC South. I mean, that's that's pretty much one of those two teams is going to take one whether it be the, the Panthers or the Falcons, if the Falcons can get rolling again. But it's pretty much the Rams and the Saints and then the Packers, Vikings, and hopefully the Eagles can get back in the NFC East. AFC, Patriots and the Chiefs. Patriots and the Chiefs are just on a collision course, but don't sleep on the San Diego Chargers. Phillip Rivers, I've said this on Twitter before, Phillip Rivers is probably one of the most underrated players in the NFL in the last 10 years, last 10 to 20 years, Phillip Rivers has just been over there in San Diego or Los Angeles, wherever the hell the Chargers are at. Phillip Rivers has just been there balling on the low, and this is another year that he just continues to kill. So I'm really, really interested to see on what the Chargers can do this year. Melvin Gordon has been one of the top five backs in the NFL, very slept on running back too. I don't know why the Chargers are so slept on. I mean, I guess, like I said, they're out there. They're not in a real city. They're playing second fiddle now to the Rams. I've heard rumors that they're not building fans out there in L.A., but that's definitely probably, if you want to power rank the AFC, I, mm, between the, the Ravens and the Chargers is probably the, the third team. Obviously, the Patriots and the, the, the Chiefs are really destined to collide in the AFC Championship because those are I, I, probably the two best teams in the AFC. So that's pretty much how Week 7 looked. Boom. So speaking of the Chargers, we're going to go to what would a man player do, and we're, we're going to go down here, start with the Chargers game. I'm pretty much going to circle this whole segment around going for two. Because going for two was a big, a big part of the uh, of the gameplay this weekend. We saw the game in London between the Chargers and the Titans. I don't, I don't know if y'all saw it. I know it was early. The London game. Speaking of the London games, the Eagles have the, the Jaguars this week in the London game at 9 a.m. You got to wake up to watch it. So the Titans played the Chargers, and this comes up all the time when I'm playing in a stream, playing at home, playing around friends, whatever it may be. The Titans go down the field. They're down by seven. They go down the field, boom, scored a touchdown. It's like 30 seconds left. And Mike Vrabel said after the game, if it was under 40 seconds left, they would go ahead and try for the two-point conversion. And what happens is they go for the two-point conversion, get a holding penalty. So now the two-point conversion is actually at the one-yard line. Now, they get, go for a two-point conversion to win the game tells me, one, I don't think I can win this game in overtime. Now, you guys watch me play all the time on, on on Twitch, and if you don't, make sure you hit the follow on Twitch or check out the YouTube where I definitely record a lot of gameplays and put them up. The only time I would go for two if I honestly feel like I don't have a chance of winning the game in overtime. If I feel like I'm better than the team or I can outplay them, I will always try to extend the game as long as possible. So for me to go for two, I have to have the thought in my mind, I'm going to lose this game if it goes to overtime. Now, I don't know necessarily how that translates into the NFL, but for me personally, that's what I think. The only way I go for two, one, I have to have a, a play that's very highly successful because I don't want an entire 60-minute game or a 70-minute game coming down to one play. You know, you work all week and you do all this work, you know, all this preparation, all this game plan. You come out here and execute for 60 minutes, and you're going to ask your team to put this whole entire week down to one play. Now, me personally, I'm a great man player. I feel like I'm better than everybody I'm playing. 
I don't know if the Titans feel like they're better than everybody they're playing, but if they're competitors and they've gotten this far in, in athletics, they always feel like they're better than who they're playing. So to me, it's like if I'm better than them, let's extend the game. And the game was only 20-20. to 20. It's not like it was a super shootout where it's all about the coin toss. They could have got a stop, but they decided to go for two. Boom, they didn't get the two. They ran a little goofy play, fake screen, made Mario to make a read. And I, I honestly, I really think the Chargers played good defense. They played, played a little zone and really boxed up that play. So you got to tip your hat to the Chargers. They really stopped the play. But like I said, Mike Vrabel brought it all down to one play. And for me, that's only if I feel like I would lose to this team over time. If you feel like you can win, extend the game longer. The last example I'm going to give you, two-point conversion. We all watched Monday Night Football. We had to because they put they continue to put the Giants on Monday Night Football. God bless them. I mean, I, I guess people want to watch Odell play. <sighs> oh, Saquon, Saquon is worth the price of admission, but until they get a, a, a new quarterback, a new quarterback in there in New York, then it's going to be a slop show every time. But the biggest thing with two-point conversions with the Giants was – the Giants were down 14 points. This is the fourth quarter. Game's dwindling down. Probably five minutes left. I'm not sure exactly how much time was left. But it was definitely the fourth quarter, under 10 minutes. And the Giants are down 14. The Giants score a touchdown, I believe. It wasn't Odell. Barkley scored a touchdown. They rushed the ball up the middle. Saquon Barkley scored a touchdown. Boom. So now they're down eight. Yes, they're down eight points. The extra point will put them down seven. So, boom, they're down another seven for a touchdown. (coughs) Excuse me. So, what happens is Pat Shermer, former Eagle assistant, offensive guy, says, you know, we're going to go for two. Now, the Eagles did this, I think, two weeks ago against the Minnesota Vikings. Down 14, fourth quarter, you score a touchdown. Let's go for two. Now, when you go for two, down eight, or down 14, score a touchdown, go for two, you got to weigh the positives and the negatives. The negative is we don't get this, boom, we're going to need another two-point conversion. Because you got to sit back and think, I'm going to get a stop and get the ball back. I'm either going to be down eight or I'm going to be down six. Now, if you don't get it, I always, I've talked to you guys a million times about, I always prepare for the worst. I hope for the best, but I prepare for the worst. So the worst is I'm down eight. The worst is my two-point conversion play did not work. So for me to tie this game, I'm going to need another two-point conversion play. So if they're playing the odds, I think two-point conversions are like 60% good. If they're playing the odds, one of those two two-point conversion plays will work. If you didn't get the first time, you damn sure better get the second time to win the game or tie the game. But if you get it the first time, which is what you're hoping, if you're Pat Shermer or you're Doug Peterson or you're a man player at home, if you get it the first time, boom. <clears throat> now I'm only down six. Now I get my stop, get the ball back, boom. Now I can go ahead down the field, score a touchdown, kick the extra point, and win the game. So it's definitely something that NFL coaches are really looking at this chart. They're looking at analytics a lot more and saying, if my two-point conversion play is 60% good, then I will get one of these two con- two-point conversions. If it's the first one good, then I can win the game when I get the ball back. If it's not the first one, then I'll, I'm guaranteed to get the second one because I just got to play the percentages. Then I'll tie the game up and go to overtime. So it's just something you got to see coaches really paying more attention to analytics and the numbers and playing the percentage I see a lot of old school people really upset about, oh, it's stupid to go for two. You saw uh, Booker McFarlane on the cast the other night was definitely really uh, upset with Pat Shermer for going ahead and going for two there. I kind of like the call. It's not something that I would say is the right thing to do, but I certainly understand the logic behind it. As it pertains to Madden, I don't. you would need to have a really good two-point play. I don't, I don't think there's a two-point play in the game that's going to work 60% of the time. You know, it's tough to make a read down there. It's tough to run in and rely on it 60% of the time. But it's definitely something that if I'm in that position, I might think about doing from here on out for Madden. You know, if you're down 14 in the fourth quarter, score a touchdown, go for two. You know, because you're going to get the ball back. You're going to play defense, get the ball back. Now you have an opportunity to win the game on an extra point. Or if you don't get that two, just have another opportunity to try to get that two. So it's definitely a debate. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for that, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for going for two to win the game. But uh, that's just my thoughts behind it. Let me know what you guys think in the comments section below when you guys will go for two. If you like Mike Vrabel going for two to win the game, if your team went for two to win the game, would you like it? The last time the Eagles did it, 
they were out of the playoff race and it was like the last game of the season. So obviously if you're out of the playoff race, it's definitely something I would love to do, especially in London. I mean, the NFL is trying to bridge the game and, and open it up worldwide. You want to see an exciting finish like that. But that concludes what would a man player do. Going for two is, is always something that, you know, should should have something in the back pocket. I have no problem when a man challenged from having the best two-point play. It really it really was something that propelled him. I believe in man 12 or man 13, whenever he just snapped and do a rocket catch to the slot. And it really was a big weapon for him to go ahead and win that man challenge. But work on them two point plays, boys, because they're gonna come down to they're gonna come down to be a big part of your game. They were a big part of the NFL this weekend, and that, that's why how to break down what would man player do. So, in conclusion, had a good time watching Arizona Club Series, man. It was some great Madden. I love watching Madden. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I don't know which since you said they canceled the Vikings, I don't know which one is the next one. But we'll certainly talk about whatever club series happens this weekend or next weekend. Also, on the horizon, the Mutthead League. I believe this is Mutthead Season 6. Not sure. It's either 5 or 6. I'm pretty sure it's 6. Because I think Kiv won one, Skimbo, and then Mo won the last three. So I think it's Season 6. That's coming up on your radar. I will be competing in that because it's from home. I feel comfortable. I don't want to go any live events. But I'm definitely going to compete in Mutthead Season 6, I believe. So that's going to be something else we can talk about on the podcast. So I really hope, really appreciate you guys checking it out, whether you're on Twitch, YouTube, audio service, whatever you may be on. I really appreciate you guys checking it out, and I'm out of here.